Banjo-Kazooie Nuts and Bolts summed up in one word would be disappointment. After appearing in two of gaming's most iconic and beloved 3D platformers, the duo's long-awaited return to consoles eventually resulted in a game about putting cars back together seriously and, sadly, was a far inferior experience to its predecessors. I could say the same thing about the notorious Zelda CDI titles, which ultimately couldn't hold a candle to the juggernaut the rest of the series proved to be. This kind of disappointment doesn't need to come from full games, though. Take the infamously weak library level from Halo Combat Evolved, a sprawling, confusing mess that's easily among the worst of Master Chief's adventures. Now, small catch. I've never actually played Nuts and Bolts, or Zelda CDI, or the original Halo, but I still know what I'm supposed to say here. These things have entrenched reputations and going with the flow is an easy way to score brownie points on YouTube. I bring this up because I swear that's not what I thought I'd be doing with this video. I expect their opinions on Smash stages to be pretty diverse, but when I asked my audience about the worst one, it turns out there was a pretty clear consensus, and I was part of it. 75 Meters, a stage that debuted all the way back in Brawl and has managed to hold on to its uniquely sour reputation ever since, an impressive feat in a series which now features over 100 stages. Today, we dive into how it pulled this off, and it may be deeper than you think. I'm Mock Rock, and 75 Meters is Smash's broken mistake. <laughs> this video is sponsored by Raid Shadow Legends, the legendary RPG for mobile and desktop that throws you into a world of raid bosses, dungeons, a full campaign, PvP arena, and more. With over 500 unique champions to collect and upgrade, the possibilities for forming your own strategy are endless. Let's see what I mean. Alright, hi, voice preserving Mock Rock here. So far, a lot of the strongest champions and gear I've gotten have been fairly offense based. We've got some counter attacks, area of effect damage, party attack boost, some attack boosting armor. So I decided to lean into that angle for now, but I still needed to choose a final champion. I've ended up going with this Crusader because his skill allows him to attack alongside another champion, which lets me sort of double dip into my strongest attackers. This kind of forced adaptation is the single biggest design strength of summoning systems in my book, and the combo variety here is. Pretty ludicrous. And that variety is only growing. This month alone, Raid has added 11 new champions, almost 200 missions guarding an exclusive legendary champion, and 5 tough levels for almost every dungeon in the game. So, what are you waiting for? Go to the video description, click on my links, and support my channel by downloading Raid today. I'm in there as Mockrock, and I hope to see you in game. Donkey Kong. Based on my audience demographics, most of you have probably never actually played this game, but I'm guessing you know what it is. The first appearance of Mario, the first appearance of DK, the first real platformer, and one of the most iconic and important games of all time. Its legacy speaks for itself. Its appearance in Smash, a series where celebrating the legacy of Nintendo is really the core concept, was a no-brainer. But the layout chosen to represent it is a bit unusual. Put yourself in the shoes of a designer sitting down to plan out all the new stages that are going to appear in Super Smash Bros. Brawl. As said, Donkey Kong is an obvious game to include, and while it's a score-based game that takes place over four looping stages, one of them is clearly more famous than the rest. A stage so iconic that barrels, which only appear as an obstacle on this one, are still a staple of the franchise's iconography to this very day. Does that necessarily make it the best available layout for a Smash stage, though? Well, to start off, 75 meters isn't actually based on the original Donkey Kong for arcade, it's derived from the later port for the NES, which had to make some substantial changes in order to function on the more limited hardware, a factor essentially all arcade ports had to account for at the time. One of these changes included cutting the fourth stage, which simply doesn't appear on the NES in any way, shape, or form. Whether the Smash team needed to use the NES version as their baseline or chose to voluntarily, I can't say. But for the sake of argument, let's assume there was some kind of logistical reason behind it and strike this one off the list of candidates. Okay, so that leaves us with three survivors, and directly comparing them, the decision does start to make sense. While all three of them would be large, chaotic stages filled with obstacles, the other two have very repetitive and somewhat dull terrain layouts. Whereas 75 meters has moving platforms, a highly asymmetrical layout, multiple different mobile hazards to worry about. Alright, we're in business. This has all the makings of a fun, wacky layout for Smash.
That's what I'd imagine they were thinking. Now we're going to spend the rest of the video talking about why I think they were wrong. Despite some minor tweaks to its layout and hazards, for example, the lack of a lower floor or the fact that Donkey Kong isn't always throwing his spring, 75 meters is overall a very faithful recreation of the original stage, which is actually pretty rare in Smash. Despite drawing from known areas, there's typically a heavy amount of interpretation involved while creating each stage, allowing for an environment that invokes its home series but is, first and foremost, tailored around the mechanics of Smash. 75 meters isn't totally alone with its approach, there are a few more recreated stages, largely also retro single screens, but Donkey Kong stands out because of the genre it's in. Remember, this was the first defined platformer video game, so its terrain was inherently designed to be hostile to navigate. Now, in this environment, it's certainly not as hostile as the original. Mario, or Jumpman as he was known back then, controlled like a lead turtle, with sluggish speed, a miserable feeling jump, unreliable climbing that was easy to get stuck on, and what I can only imagine are some very bad knees considering how little height he can fall from. Violet! Super Smash Bros. obviously embraced an updated platforming feel, with even its most sluggish roster members running circles around their forefather, but that doesn't automatically make this layout pleasant to navigate. There are two main ways that Smash fans tend to approach the game, as a casual, fun romp that anyone can pick up and enjoy, and as a diehard competitive fighting game. 75 meters is not suitable for competitive play by any means, for a lot of the reasons I'm about to go into, so that leaves a casual experience, and for a game to be enjoyable on a casual level, it has to be enjoyable by any skill level. Now, a fundamental movement technique in Super Smash Bros. is short hopping, or pressing and releasing the jump button very quickly in order to perform a shorter jump than usual. It's considered part of the basics for experienced players, but can be a little tricky, I still miss a short hop once in a while in the middle of an intense fight, and a less invested fan may well not even know the option exists. Point of view, you're one of these players, just a person who likes Nintendo looking for some fun crossover action with friends, and you want to move from this platform to this one. My god that's clumsy, and takes such a long time for such a fast game. Well, I guess that platform isn't really necessary most of the time, you can just hop right onto the upper one. Oh. Okay, so you can double jump onto the upper platform at least, but at the pace Smash moves at, this is still pretty slow and clumsy to do. There are ways to speed this up. Again, you can short hop to get onto the lower platform, but another way to speed up both the lower and upper platform approaches would be to fast fall. Another fundamental movement technique that lets you increase your fall speed after reaching the apex of your jump. Still not something every player is going to know about, but at least it's something we can do to make these jumps feel a little bit better. Oh, come on. Oh, come on. You know what? Okay, I think we need to take a moment to talk about ladders. <laughs> ladders in video games usually kind of suck. You know what players generally like? Options. The ability to interact with a game's world is the primary advantage of the medium, and as soon as you're shown a possible interaction, having it taken away from you means losing part of your connection to that world. Does that mean every time the developers give you a method of interaction they can never take it away for any reason whatsoever? Of course not, but it is a decision that fundamentally introduces a detriment, so it should also introduce a benefit which offsets that detriment. In Smash, an example of this would be hit stun, the inability to use most of your options right after being hit. No attacking, no dodging, no jumping, all you can do is slightly influence your trajectory with the control stick until enough time has passed for you to recover. This is clearly a limit on interactivity, but it's doing so, obviously, for the sake of making combos possible, an extremely integral part of the series' combat. Solid terrain limits your options in order to dictate the flow of a stage. Grabbing someone limits your options in order to facilitate a new offensive mechanic. Ladders limit your options in order to... Um, ladders strongly limit possible interactions across the board, and generally speaking, the best thing you can say about them is that they're functional. But it's almost always a moment where fun is temporarily being stripped away for the sake of that function. Sometimes, sure, ladders are just what was needed, but as a general rule of thumb, I'd say games which use alternatives usually benefit from that decision. Now, one of the games where this is not the case, of course, is Donkey Kong, which embraces the inherent limitations ladders introduce as a key part of its gameplay. Similar limitations exist in Smash as well. And while I appreciate that Ultimate at least tries to alleviate this to some degree by allowing attacks to be done on ladders, its impact is fairly minimal and its implementation was… not terribly elegant. 
So these ladders come with restrictions that resemble the original, but are these accompanied by the same essential nature to the gameplay? No, not at all. Smash characters are highly mobile, and every character on the roster can comfortably handle the gaps that the ladders are filling, with the partial exception of specifically these ones, which can have a case made for them out of sheer necessity. For the rest of them though, the benefit they offer is extremely minimal and the detriment to being on one is significant, so their overall impact on the game, as far as I'm concerned, is a net negative. Make sense? Well. We're not done yet, remember this? Getting onto a ladder just requires tapping up or down while you're near one, or even diagonally, which are inputs that you're going to be doing quite a bit in general play, so accidentally latching onto one is really easy. It doesn't help that 75 meters platforms are all thin, with very tight spacing, so phasing through and ending up on an entirely different level than you even wanted to is par for the course with this stage. And it's not even that easy to correct this after you do it. These thin platforms can be passed through both up and down, mandatory to navigate the stage with anything resembling smoothness. Except you can't drop through a platform if there's a ladder on top of that section. Now, of course, yes, you can move a bit to the side of the ladder to drop through. Yes, you can position yourself so that fast falling without touching a ladder is an option. Hopping around in training mode isn't the end of the world, although it's frankly still not a great experience, but in the middle of a chaotic battle, the margins for this go down considerably. While the specific scenarios I showcased earlier aren't universal, different air physics do alter them, these moments appear all over the stage. And the end result is a layout where trying to go anywhere and do anything is awkward, tiring, and easy to mess up. And make no mistake, moving around frantically is a necessity to play on this stage. The platforms are so absurdly small that any reasonably powerful blow landed on an opponent will leave you without a fight and force you to seek out a new one, making this one of the stages that most emphasizes traversal in the series while simultaneously doing everything in its power to harm the act of traversal. The only exception to this is the upper platform, which heavily disincentivizes combat on it thanks to the intermittent springs. The stage hazards overall are honestly not terrible. I generally prefer pretty subdued hazards in casual matches, but that's a subjective preference, and as mentioned, the springs are less dense than they were in the original game, which is a good call. That said, considering how much space they cover and how frequent they still are, their knockback seems tuned really high. Casual smash isn't really supposed to be fair or balanced, but this is definitely approaching the upper edge of how strong any obstacle is in the series, stage hazard, item, or otherwise. Some people will have a threshold for obstacles that fall into the category, of too obstructive and some won't. But for those that do, the springs are powerful enough that even if they're not over the threshold, they'll have to be at least close to it. Another element that feels off? The ledges. Only the lowest platforms have grabbable ledges, but there's no visual indication of any kind that this would be the case. So unless you've thoroughly explored this stage, which, let's be honest, you haven't, it's easy to go for what seems like a reasonable ledge grab that never actually comes. It makes sense that the ledges had to be designed this way, and I don't see a great way around it. If the upper platforms had them too, then you'd be constantly grabbing onto them unintentionally, but it's still extremely unintuitive. The ledges that do exist have their own issues as well. Because the platforms are squeezed so close together and all have ledges on both sides, this can result in some really awkward behavior that doesn't always put you where you'd expect to be, and in the worst cases can even be somewhat buggy. Or, for a few characters, unbelievably buggy, to a degree I'm genuinely surprised made it past playtesting. Some characters just need to grab the ledge for this to show up, while others are going to need a bit of forward momentum first. It seems to be related to the way each character's lowest point, or root, is calculated during their ledge grab animation. Too high at the right time, and boom, they're considered standing. Now, with that said, some characters do have similarly high animations without this behavior. And while I don't have the tools to test this and couldn't find any information whatsoever on the topic, my assumption is that the root isn't handled totally consistently across every character, because when have Smash animations ever lined up with their performance, am I right? Where's the rest of you? Hey, I gotta live with this, you can deal with hearing about it every handful of videos. Do the ledges do this for most of the roster? No. 
Is it inherently the stage's fault as opposed to a flaw in the way ledges are programmed? No. But 75 meters layout is the reason we see such an egregious example of this behavior, and even ignoring the glitches, these kinds of stacked ledges can cause some other undesirable scenarios and probably should just be avoided. The outer platforms are also incredibly close to the blast zones, although I can at least appreciate that they've been changed from Brawl, which had a lot more walk-offs. Walk-off sections aren't inherently bad all the time, but they are notoriously exploitable, so this was a very good change in my book. Now, there's only one walk-off on the stage, and it's hard to camp by it because of the springs and the ability to attack it from below, so thumbs up to that part of the design at least. The platform placement overall makes kills feel very unbalanced though, and it's hard to think of a good reason for this decision beyond that's how the original screen looked which really is the fundamental issue that plagues this stage at the end of the day. If the developers had been willing to mess with the platform layouts more to make them more navigable, for example, the ladders would really have no reason whatsoever to exist and could easily just be decoration. Even if you're in the group that likes the idea of the ladders, though, please give me one good reason for this one to be here. Because I seriously can't think of any outside of the fact that this is what it was like in Donkey Kong. This is not Donkey Kong. It's a completely separate series with its own mechanics, and if you told me that you imported a layout verbatim from any other franchise, my default assumption would be that it didn't work very well, because why would it? The original level designers were not focused on creating a layout that would play perfectly in a platform fighter. But of all the times the series has tried this, the most memorable is… what, maybe Duck Hunt? It works fine enough, but I don't know how many people you'd find chomping at the bit for it. There are once again huge restrictions to its layout that none of the series' fan favorites had to deal with. I made a video a little while back praising the design of Temple, and the thing is, if you know its origins, it actually invokes the layout of the game it's taken from pretty well. The key distinction is that rather than the design of a leftmost entry which descends into the ground being a restriction the designers were originally locked into, they were allowed to use that as inspiration to create some impeccably designed paths that outline distinct and memorable sections, support a wide array of rule sets, are welcoming to beginners while not losing their charm as you gain experience… just… ugh. Temple is so good in so many ways, ways that if it was ripped straight out of Zelda 2 would not exist. The thing is, Temple really needed that stellar design, because it, like 75 meters, is a mega stage, which I'd argue start off at an inherent disadvantage. Super Smash Bros. is, fundamentally, a game about mascots hitting each other, that's the game's core appeal. And the more space between those mascots, the less time will be spent engaging with that core appeal, the smashing per second goes down. The need for this type of stage has gone up in recent titles thanks to the introduction of 8-player Smash, but that's realistically a very niche mode and didn't even exist in the game that 75 meters was introduced in. When I put out that informal survey on Twitter, it's not surprising that a lot of the other answers I got were also for various mega stages, which haven't necessarily done the best job trying to overcome this disadvantage, but most of them still have at least an obvious purpose behind their design. The Great Cave Offensive may be a bit of a nightmare, but it's clearly designed for off-kilter 8-player mayhem, and still opts for some sections that allow for more straightforward fighting. That one was made with knowledge about 8-player Smash though, so a more fair comparison would be to New Pork City, which also debuted in Brawl. From what I've seen, people don't tend to be big fans of this one either, and I'm in that camp. But there are still reasonable combat areas, an interesting custom obstacle, a stage hazard that feels purposeful. Overall, it feels much more like it fits into the Smash world than 75 meters does, because, of course, it was designed specifically for the Smash world. When I refer to 75 meters as a mistake, this is why. It took two fundamentally flawed starting points, a recreation and a mega stage, and merged them together, without any thought given towards solving the flaws either of those concepts introduced. As soon as just one decision was made, though, to make a recreation, the designers' fates were essentially sealed. At this point, it really had to be a mega stage as well. So, how could they have recreated 75 meters in a way that worked better? Don't. At this point, we've tried solid platforms, we've tried drop-through platforms, we've tried walk-offs, we've tried ledges, and the pieces are not coming together. Who is the stage actually made for? It doesn't work on a casual newcomer level because they're hardly going to be able to do anything. It doesn't work for experienced Smash players because the carefully practiced movement that's such a key part of the game's fun is frequently being tampered with for no justifiable reason. I wouldn't even say that it really works for Donkey Kong fans, not unless you consider a bad stage nobody ever wants to play on to be a good tribute. 
If the developers' hearts were really set on including Donkey Kong as a stage, then maybe some kind of morphing one that took you between the different layouts would be at least a bit better, but none of them individually work all that well for Smash. A stage that took the same approach I referred to earlier, one that invoked the spirit of the original game without sticking strictly to its layout, would probably be the best middle ground, but would clearly be watering down the nostalgic appeal they were aiming for. Game development is a long series of trade-offs. Resources put into one feature are resources that can't be put into another. If we never got 75 meters, we'd probably have another stage instead, which would almost certainly be an improvement. Now, stage preference is, of course, an incredibly subjective topic, and I know there are going to be viewers who are fans of this stage for any number of reasons, whether they're genuinely into its design or just have fond memories of playing on it with their Donkey Kong-loving dad, and those are totally valid. Please believe me when I say that I am not here to tell you what to like. But I am here to say that, at least through my eyes, 75 meters remains Smash's broken mistake. Thanks for watching everyone, and hey, if you liked it, why not leave a like? Let me know your thoughts on 75 meters, good or bad, and be sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell for more videos like this. You can also find me on Twitter at Mr. Mockrock, Twitch at Mockrock Twitch, one word. And if you'd like to get some cool perks, including early videos, content polls, and more, these are available through Patreon, YouTube membership, or subscribing on Twitch. Later, people! Today's contender is arguably the most iconic attack in the history of Super Smash Bros., the Falcon Punch. A Smash original first seen in the debut Nintendo 64 title, the Falcon Punch Breath of the Wild. Is there any controversy with calling this the most impactful Nintendo title in modern memory? It's the bombshell that sprung from the...